Welcome everybody to the latest IGPM webinar on climate change and health and sustainability. We're joined today by Dr. Veena Agarwal, who's a GP registrar and sustainability guru with NHS England, and also Karen Crefield, practice manager, colleague, and PCN manager from Frome Med uh, Froome, Froome, Froome Medical Practice. Um, so hopefully we're going to hear some wonderful hints and tips on how to make this an easy change for us all. So I'm going to hand over to Veena. Uh, Robin is going to be manning the chat. Please do use that and put any questions in there. Uh, and there will be a Q&A at the end if you want to hang on for that. So without further ado, thank you, Veena. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm Vina. I'm a GP registrar in South West London, and I've just finished doing a year long fellowship with Greener NHS about sustainability in primary care. So I'm just going to start off by talking briefly about the links between climate change and health, why the health system should be involved on climate change, and then talk about the different resources and things you can do. And then I'll pass over to Karen, who can talk about the fantastic work that she's been doing in Froome. So the impact of climate change on human health. This is something that I think we all know about climate change. We all know about the heat wave that happened a month or two ago, about the floods in Pakistan, about all the different ways in which climate change impacts on health. And I think the extreme weather events are the ones that are most commonly publicised in the media with the, the storms, the floods, the heat waves. But there are many more ways in which climate change impacts on human health as well. And some of the ways we might not realise are, for example, air pollution, which is closely linked to climate change. And air pollution um, leads to about 40,000 deaths per year in the UK. So it's actually linked to, to as much as one in 10 lung cancers. So it's and even in the UK, because of climate change, for example, Lyme disease is increasing and spreading further than it was before um, because of the increase in temperature and, and the ticks that are, are spreading wider. So that's just a bit of an overview of the different ways that climate change impacts on health. But there's more information um, on the WHO website um, and on Greener NHS about that as well, if you're interested. Um, and as I just said, we've got a lot of deaths related to air pollution, um, babies taking their breaths um, every two minutes where the air quality doesn't meet WHO standards. Um, and we're expecting things to get worse, so up to half of Africa's population to be displaced by climate change by 2030. And I wanted to bring it back to the UK and to, to what's happening here um, and to a very sad case of, of a little girl called Ella Kissy Deborah, who um, died in 2013 and she was nine years old and she died from an asthma attack. And in the last three years of her life, she'd been in and out of hospital 27 times with asthma. And she lived 25 metres from the South Circular Road in Lewisham, which is an extremely polluted area. And what's really important about her case is that she's the first person to have air pollution written on her death certificate in the UK. And her mum campaigned for many years for there to be another inquest to have air pollution recognised as a reason that her, her asthma led her to die. Um, and so it's really important that we as healthcare professionals recognise the impact that air pollution has on our patients and that we can talk to them about things that they can do about it. And also um, one of the things that, that Rosamond, her mum, who's now a, a sort of very um, powerful advocate on air pollution, talks about how both healthcare professionals and patients need to be educated about air pollution and, and how they can avoid it. So why should healthcare professionals be involved with climate change? Well, some of the reasons we've just talked about, but it's important that we do no harm. That's one of the main principles of healthcare. And actually the NHS is a huge carbon emitter. It's the biggest public sector emitter. It's 5% of the whole UK's carbon emissions in itself. And actually because climate change is such a big threat to human health, we actually have a really big opportunity to improve health if we can act on climate change. So I'm just going to talk a bit about Greener NHS and what Greener NHS does. So Greener NHS is part of NHS England. And in 2020, the NHS became the world's first health system to commit, commit to reaching net zero. Um, and this year, every trust and every ICS has produced a green plan. Um, and we know that actually all of the staff, we've got 1.4 million NHS staff. So we've got a lot of people 
um, all of us have a role to play in reaching, reaching this goal. And a lot of surveys, both done by the NHS and other organisations such as YouGov, have shown that actually over 90% of NHS staff support making the NHS more sustainable because of the benefits it brings, not only to the planet, but to the health of people as well. And you can see here that um, the Delivering a Net Zero NHS report, and it's, it's a really interesting report, actually. It's, um, it's fairly long, but it's got a lot of different graphs, a lot of different what we call waterfall charts, which show the different ways in which the NHS can reach net zero. Um, and that was produced in 2020 um, and has become um, a really key document. So I'd encourage you to just have a quick look at that. So where do the emissions come from in the NHS? When we talk about NHS emissions, one of the first things that I often hear from people is, oh yes, we waste so much plastic, that's, that's really important. And it is, it is important to reduce plastic, but actually it's not the only source of emissions by any means. Um, and you can see in this pie chart, a sort of breakdown of where the um, carbon emissions come from. Medicines is about 20% in itself. Our supply chain is huge of all the medical and non-medical equipment that we use. Um, and there are so many other aspects as well, such as patient and staff travel, um, our buildings, um, and there are particular hotspots like um, inhalers and anaesthetic gases. So if you look at the chart on the right hand side, you can see where the emissions come from in primary care. And actually what's interesting about primary care is that about 60% of our emissions come from the, the medical clinical side. So inhalers and, and medicines that we prescribe but there are also other hotspots such as um, travel, um, our business services, our ways of operating and our equipment as well. So there's quite a broad um, spectrum of different ways in which we, we um, emit in primary care. And in primary care, we're about 20% of the NHS's carbon emissions. So I guess if you look at the overall country, we're about 1% of the country's carbon emissions. So there's lots we can do in primary care. So as well as looking at the individual areas of emissions and trying to reduce them, by looking at the principles of sustainable healthcare, it can give us a bit of a framework about how we can do this. So prevention, by preventing people having disease in the first place and tackling inequalities, the greenest thing is people not even needing to come in for healthcare, right? Empowering patients to take a greater role in managing their own care. Lean service delivery, which is, I guess, a bit jargony, but what it really means is making sure that things are streamlined, efficient, we're not duplicating things, and we're minimising waste, not only in the kind of what, sort of plastic or, or sort of um, landfill side of it, but in terms of reducing wasteful activities in, in multiple senses, really. And then low carbon alternatives could be anything from using a lower carbon inhaler to using technologies, so these principles are really important and actually I think what this shows us is that sustainable healthcare is good not just because it's good for the environment but because these things are core cool. and these things actually are what make our health service good anyway this is what makes healthcare good so this is why it's vital that we practice healthcare sustainably and the triple bottom line of sustainable healthcare is something that um, the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare talk about quite a lot and it's really important because what it shows is that sustainability is good for all of these three things. It helps the environment, it helps people's health and society in general, and it's also often economically beneficial. So if we can save money, improve health and improve the environment at the same time, what's not to like? So I just wanted to briefly touch on some of the different networks and resources and, and places that you can go to to find out more and to get involved. Greener Practice is a network for primary care professionals. It's a grassroots organisation. It's completely free to join. Um, and, and it has lots of information and resources on the website. There are lots of different networks. So um, there are 27 local groups um, where you can connect up with other people in your area and find out what they're doing and how you can link up with them. Um, there's also some national special interest groups, which are mainly via WhatsApp. And they're really helpful because people ask each other questions all the time and get ideas from each other. And there's a variety of topics from estates to education to respiratory. Um, so you can join any of those which you like as well. Green and Practice have produced a really fantastic asthma quality improvement toolkit. And this helps clinicians to do quality improvement projects um, on asthma. 
And this is a really important topic at the moment because of the investment and impact fund. And that's trying to encourage um, clinicians to prescribe inhalers in a way that's more environmentally friendly, but also improves care for patients. So I'd encourage you to have a look at the Greener Practice website, join any networks that you're interested in, and also let, let um, others in your practice know about it because they might be interested in using the resources there. The Green Impact for Health Toolkit, some of you may be aware of already. Um, and this is a really good toolkit that's been um, sponsored by the RCGP. And um, it's free to sign up and you sign your practice up and then you can look at lots of different areas. Um, you can see the different um, categories here. And they, they give you ideas and details and links to things on how you can make improvements in each of those areas. And then um, you can be audited. Um, it's actually run by um, a student organization. Um, and the students can just have an informal call with you, find out how you're doing, and you actually get an award based on um, the amount of, of different things you've done. So the Green Impact Health Toolkit is a really good resource. And I know that Karen's going to touch on it um, in a minute as well. And then the, the last one is the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. So um, this is another organisation which does loads of fantastic um, courses. They have events, um, they have some written guides, um, and lots of different networks as well. So have a look at the website and um, they've got some fantastic courses and they've got one that's primary care specific as well. Um, and they're all, on, I think, online still. Um, most of their courses are one, one day or two days um, and they're really, really good. So um, yeah, that's my bit. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now um, and pass over to Karen. Thank you, Vina. That was really, really helpful. Can I just ask you one quick question? As a clinician, um, what what one thing could our clinicians do if we were going to? I'm going to ask the same question of Karen a bit later, but from a non-clinical perspective, what could we take back to our clinicians as one one thing to maybe look at um, that might be quick win might be the wrong phrase, but but something that was was fairly simple but would, would have a, a reasonable impact? I think from a clinical point of view, some of the really quick wins can come from inhalers because there are there are some really easy ways of switching people between we don't advocate blanket switching of inhalers, but there are some switches of brands that can make it really quick and easy without having to see everybody. Um, but there are also lots of ways in which which may take a little bit more work um, to actually improve people's control as well, um, which is greener too. Um, so I'd say within inhalers, there are some really quick wins. Um, and yeah, having a browse through the asthma toolkit. Um, there, there are some projects there that are, are easier and some that are more challenging. Um, so depending on how much time or resource people have got, um, I think I think there's some good things there. Also in the Green Impact Health Toolkit, some of the changes are really, really easy in there. That's great, thank you. I, I suppose actually our um, our PCM pharmacy teams could help us with, with things like this as well. So it's not something necessarily that a doctor needs to get involved with, but um, they'll have some input, but we could get the pharmacists on it. So super, thank you. How's the chat Definitely. looking, Robin? Anything that we, any questions for Vina before we move on? As a one so far, which is what can practice managers do to help? And I think that's a nice segue into here's Karen to yeah. tell you exactly that. <laughs> Super, thank you. Karen, so if you share your screen and we'll let you have the floor. So thank you. So thank you. Just let me share my screen a moment. Great. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me to talk today. So I'm going to just try and talk a little bit to you about our journey with sustainability. And one of the first things I'm going to talk about actually is the Green Impact Toolkit. So um, just following on from that question, what can practice managers do? I think one of the main thing to do is to sign up to the toolkit. So some really great advice on there, um, lots of top tips and lots of ideas about how you can take things forward as well. Um, the other thing I'll say about the toolkit is it's a really good way of evaluating where you already are. And um, I think that's a really good thing to start celebrating with your teams and start building on. So just check it, everyone can hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, good, great. So moving on. 
I think I'm going to base my presentation today on what I'd call the five critical success factors. So these are the things that have really worked for us in Froome and the things that have really made a difference. So one of the things I'm really passionate about is getting your values right as an organisation. And I think for us in Froome, you know, really sorting out those values right at the beginning of our journey has been one of the things that's really underpinned what we've done and really helped with culture. And I think if you get those two things right from the beginning, you've got a really good foundation to work from. I'll then move on to talk a little bit about teamwork, positive actions and how we can engage our teams. So starting with values. So five years ago, we all sat down and we talked about our values as an organisation with our partners, our patient participation group, with our staff. And we came up with the three values of learning, sustainability and responsibility. And for me, the great thing about these three values was they all speak to the green agenda and they've all really helped with our decision making and everything we've, we've done thereon. We also spent a lot of time as a team really talking about how we can embed values. So anybody who knows me will know that I get quite passionate about the values, but I get quite passionate about living those values to making sure that they're in everything that we do. So one of the things we did when we were really trying to work on sustainability was making sure we had a standing agenda item in every meeting. We do weekly staff bulletins where we do lots of um, top tips. And they can be really simple things. Um, that just really help educate staff. It might be, you know, what's the cost of leaving your computer screen on for a minute? And one of the things that we'll share at the end of this webinar is some top tips which have come from um, a great GP called Matt Sawyer of some of the things that you can encourage people in your teams to do to make a difference. And they're, and they're really small, manageable things. We've embedded into our appraisal and probation process our values. So our staff actually get evaluated and they talk about their aims and objectives relative to our values. We try and success um, share our success stories just so we can encourage others to get involved. And what we've also done is done quite a lot of work with um, our interview process. So we ask questions about sustainability when somebody comes for an interview with us. We ask them what they're doing. We ask them, we ask them what their interests are. So when people start working with us, we hope they're already aligned with our values. And we've spent quite a lot of work so just there on our website as well. So one of the key things that we've done is made sure that our website's got lots of information on. And again, I'll share that at the end. So anybody's very welcome to go onto the website and have a look at some of the things we've done. So we run weekly education sessions on a variety of topics, but we have made sure that the green agenda is very much part of that. So that might be training on choosing wisely, motivational interviewing, and we've also made carbon literacy training mandatory. And again, just going back to Matt Sawyer, he provided some great training to all of our staff team. And again, I'll share some details about how you can um, get involved with doing that at the end of the webinar. We welcome all our staff when they start with us with a, a green water bottle, um, encouraging them to obviously healthy drinking habits, but also, you know, we make them aware of our refill station, which is part of a community project that we're involved with. We also really focus on trying to build our values into our reward systems. So one of the things that we've done is um, we celebrate fair trade fortnight um, and we try and reward staff with fair trade hampers when they've gone above and beyond. And we also have a regular um, voucher, sort of thank you um, thing. So basically two or three times a year, we'll reward staff, maybe the whole team with vouchers. And we make sure they come from local sustainable organisations. So we have a great thing called Free Me Gifts, for example, which means that you can go and treat yourself to something in a local restaurant or a local shop. We have vouchers for our local leisure centre, um, for a veg box scheme and for a local refill shop. So we try and again, just embed those values with those things. And um, Fina's already mentioned the great work that the Centre of Sustainable Healthcare do, and we try to work closely with them and also have work experience um, students. So trainee doctors come and do sort of two, three week projects with us. So building foundations for culture and organisational change. Sometimes that's a really good question practice managers ask is where do you start? And um, for us, I think three really important things was to get three policies in place. The first of those was a green impact for health policy. The second was a staff health and wellbeing policy. And the third was our corporate social responsibility policy. I'll just talk a little bit about those. So 
the green impact policy was very much initially led by some of the targets that we set ourselves from fulfilling the green impact toolkit i'd say more lately it's become a much more project focused policy so looking at some of the things we've got here i'll just get rid of myself here so you can see so the green impact policy includes lots of things around energy use it has our lighting plan on there it's got um, information about sustainable travel plans so we've done that with our patients with our staff We've switched to um, electric cars. We have three electric cars at the practice that we use for all our home visits. We have a cycle to work scheme that we've recently enhanced. So that includes electric bikes. And we've also been really proactive in encouraging hybrid working because we know that if a staff member can work from home and they're traveling long distances to work, then that helps reduce sort of staff travel. So that's been quite a recent change, but has worked really well. We focus on the three R's. Um, I'd say a big project for us at the moment is working um, harder to reduce our waste. So our aim is to try and make sure at least 50% of our waste is also recycled. Our policy talks about deprescribing projects. So Vina's already mentioned that 60% of carbon emissions comes from the medicine side. So we've done lots of work on dry powder inhalers, but we've expanded that work to try and do de prescribing work with opioids, gabapentinoids, hypnotics, and had a really strong approach towards lifestyle medicine and running you know, different courses. So somebody who's on an opioid reduction program might be taking part in a group consultation for lower back pain. So we tried to link those two together. And one of the big things I can talk a little bit more about towards the end, if anyone's got questions, is our main focus at the moment also is working on our procurement and switching suppliers when we can, but also just really trying to tackle procurement by having really good audits of all our suppliers where they make commitments to their sustainability. I just put there a very simple switch that we've done in the last couple of weeks actually to be changed over on our staff badges to a more sustainable supplier. And the policy also includes things about um, our, what we eat, what we consume. So we now have plant-based food for all our events and for all our meetings. Fair trade tea and coffee, and slightly later I'll talk about our staff wellbeing garden as well. So our staff health and wellbeing policy, I think we'll probably, you know, all of us as practice managers, this will be core to what we do. And I think what I always try and say to people is, if we're looking after ourselves, we're also looking after the planet. And for me, that seems something that was really obvious when I started work at the practice, but I really realised people weren't always making that link. So I think that's something we can all really encourage everybody to do. If we can look after our patients, reduce hospital emissions, we're reducing our carbon. Our senior partner did a really great calculation recently about hospital emissions. If we saved one hospital admission based on an average of 7.5 days in hospital, that's the equivalent of saving 3,255 miles of driving. You know, which I thought, you know, those kind of messages I think are quite handy to have and you know coming from a basis of looking after ourselves so in our staff and health being policy we've looked very closely at our partnerships so we've partnered with our local leisure center our sunset sports partnership we've worked on wellness programs we quite we're quite early adopters of bringing in a menopause policy for our staff and we've done things like having group consultations just for our staff team to help support them Last year, we were the main partner in Froome's first Kindness Festival, which was very much um, focused on health and well-being. We try and have a culture of shared lunches. It's quite important for us. We have 150 staff on our team. So trying to get everybody together and have you know spaces where we can all meet up is quite important for us. We run an in-house compassionate listeners program. And we try and at least twice a year do what we call health and well-being weeks, where we might bring massage therapists in, a yoga teacher do some stress management we're a park run practice and do things like couch to 5k so all those things are big contributors to our well-being policy and for me i think one of the most exciting things we've done in the last 12 months is to um, create what i've called the staff well-being garden so we have 12 raised beds all with organic soil all using reclaimed timber we have an area in the staff well-being garden where staff can just go and have a cup of tea and we have teams that look after the beds. We have certain individuals have a bed to themselves, but quite often people work in pairs or in teams. 
So it's been really good for staff morale and um, getting people outside and doing something after a stressful day or maybe during a lunchtime. And what we've also done with that is we've tried to create a closed loop system for our food waste. So all our food waste now goes into these amazing tea hot compost composters that our landlord very kindly sponsored for us. And we also put wood chip and things in there. So and all that still then goes back into those beds. So that's been a, a really positive project. Got lots of people involved, including the local community. And then finally, the last policy that we've done has been our um, ethical sponsorship or corporate social responsibility policy. So that really is a policy around you know who we might accept donations from, but also more importantly, possibly our charity commitment. So we try and commit to having a charity of the year, or sometimes we do that for two years with a charity. We've recently started working with a charity called Active in Touch, who are local to us. And um, one of the great outcomes of that is they're actually going to be opening up a cafe in the medical centre, which will be sustainable, and that's going to happen at the start of next year. So that's kind of really wrapped up, I guess, um, values and culture. But I think probably one of the most important things, if you're a practice manager and you're looking to think, where do I start with this? I would just say teamwork's probably one of the most important messages that I can put there. You can't do this on your own. And I often talk to people who are struggling and they have tried to do it on their own because they felt like they're the only person, passionate person who's in their practice. So I think you seek out people that can work with you. And that might be seeking out people externally to work with you. So one of our first early wins was we partnered with an organisation called Refill Free. There's lots of them around the country. And we just very simply put in a water refill station that's used by our patients. And that was, you know, quite a positive starting point for lots of good conversations. On the back of that, Freem Town Council then came and did a free energy audit for us and a green business review. And that led to a much stronger partnership. So at the moment, we're in the second year of a national lottery funded project for climate action with our local town council and a social enterprise group called Adventure. And that gives us two years of funding for a green community health connector who works with us and with the community. And it's given us extra funding for some of that de-prescribing work that I mentioned earlier. We've also worked with the town council on plastic free periods and addressing period equality. And I'll say that very much came from looking through the toolkit. What actions can we do? That was one which, you know, I thought actually this is something we should be doing more work on. We have a young person's clinic. We have, um, I mean, I think it really struck home for me when I had a colleague who sat across the room from me, who said that her granddaughter hadn't gone to school that day because they couldn't afford period products. And it really struck home to me that, you know, these are kind of things that we can be doing more work to address. So we got some funding from the town council. We worked with WUCA who do um, period pants. They're now part of um, food boxes um, as part of our local community um, offer with Fair Froom. I think the next thing to talk about for me is positive action. So when we're talking about a climate emergency, I think for many people, it is completely overwhelming. I feel overwhelmed by it. You know, we feel like we have to be making these great big massive changes. And the reality is we do. But I think we also need to start where people are at and start getting people engaged from where they're at. And I've always taken the approach that no action is too small. So and what I have noticed over the five years of doing this work is how small actions have grown into bigger actions with staff, how, you know, they come tell you what they're doing at home that they weren't doing before, how they've started thinking about the clothes they're buying, the food they're buying. And I think this slide for me is just showing you the range of things you might, might find. Somebody's put something up there like, um, I'm going to keep recycling paper envelopes. We're not going to make a big impact with it, but that person has actually thought about what they're going to do, which is for me is engagement. Somebody's changing from um, their tea bags to plastic free ones. And then we have these, you know, quite strong messages like I'm not going to fly again. I'm going to stop eating meat. So I think it's just being aware in your practice, as you probably are, that we're going to have people at all different starting points. And it's finding where you can find that point of engagement with them. The other thing I'd encourage everybody to do is, is to tell your story. Um, I've been surprised how much telling our story has created change, momentum and impact. The story of Ashura, our land 
landlords funding £6,000 worth of hot composters was something I was never envisaged as being possible at the start of this journey, but it has become possible because we've taken certain steps. Um, I've put here a Guardian article. We had it, got an interview from The Guardian and it was on um, reducing carbon emissions. We started talking about dry powder inhalers and the work that we'd done. And after the article was published, our CCG phoned me up and said, well, you know, we, we're obviously trying to reduce uh, metadose inhalers, but we hadn't really thought about the environmental impact. So that created a whole change. And yeah, I know in some set we've done an awful lot of work on the back of actually just broadening what we're looking at. I also put in here in the first year that we started doing this work, we saved £10,000 in office costs just by switching to um, things like AccuRx, reducing paper and postage. And that really, really helped in my practice because, you know, as a first year in the post, as a practice manager, you know, green impact possibly wasn't on everyone's agenda at that point. But when you start showing that you can reduce costs, you've automatically got engagement to do that work. And I think for me, one of the things that is really, really powerful now is, you know, we're all in a recruitment crisis across the board. I regularly get people coming at interviews saying they're coming because they align with our values on green impact. They're really excited about some social prescribing work that we're doing. And that's only got to be a good thing. So I've tried here just to put a summary of some of my top tips. Go back to the Green Impact Toolkit if you're not already using it. Use it as a starting point. It's a really good roadmap. And celebrate what you're already doing because it's. I think if you, you acknowledge what you're already doing and you will be doing lots already, it's a great place to start building from. The biggest question I'm always asked is, how do you find time? Um, and my, quest, my answer to that is always, actually, it's a mindset. If we start thinking about it in every single thing that we do, every time we buy something, every time we do something, if we start having a different lens, it, it doesn't become extra work. It just becomes part of the everyday. And I'd, I'd really emphasize that because, I, you know, for me, I don't think this has been huge amounts of extra work. It's just been a change in perspective. Work as a team, which I've already emphasized, find external partners, find out what engages people when you're making a case for change. So remember, don't don't just engage people talking about the green agenda, talk about the financial savings, the other things that will bring more people on board. Start from where people are at. And I think going back to that earlier point, if you're looking after your own health, you're looking after the environment. And I think that that's a really important message for staff in their approach to patients. And I've just here just summarized a few of the things that we're focusing on for the next few months so we're hoping to um, get a second round of lottery funding to work with our community towards net zero for the whole town we've been looking recently at b corp accreditation um, trying to challenge ourselves to see if we can take the sustainability a little bit further but also look at some of our ethics and our approaches on things We want to really embed sustainable QI, which Fina's already mentioned, and measure carbon. So we've started now when we're negotiating with commissioners, not only to put things like the finances in, but actually show what the carbon savings are at the same time. And we've recently just put a bid into the Healthy Futures Fund to work more on our sustainable procurement. And I think we've probably got some big challenges with that because we've got some big organisations in healthcare that we are going to have to start asking questions. You know, we'll start asking those same questions, interestingly, of our ICB and CQC as we take this forward. But I think for us, that's probably where the most growth is now for us is going to sustainable procurement. So thank you for listening. Um, I've put our website address up there because there's lots of information on the website that you might want to go to. And really happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. That was really great. And I know that you've got some uh, little sort of hints and tips as well that we can maybe take away from today, which um, which you'll you'll share with us. Um, there was a question in the chat that I I, I did see about um, how you fitted it all in in the day job, but you did actually answer that. Um, <laughs> Has, um, has anybody got any questions for Karen or for Vina? Or we all, I think we're 
probably all blown away by what you're doing actually and, and how you've embedded it into just everyday activity um i mean i'll just ask you a quick question if i may on um on your sort of first week in post how did you approach this because it 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 might have been quite a big sea change for the organization so what what was your first sort of you know foot out there going this is what we need to do guys how did you get that engagement yeah actually my first day was very interesting because okay i've come from a background of higher education so i walked into primary care and if i'm honest my norms were all like turned on their head so the first thing was like well why haven't we got fair trade tea bags <laughs> was a simple one and where do i put the paper recycling so i think in my first day i decided that i was going to sort out the tea bags and sort out the paper recycling and then go from there so um yeah it was a it was an interesting start but you know i think again the, the big change probably came about two or three months later when i looked at the green impact toolkit and interestingly that was a toolkit that was um first um developed in the university sector so i was really familiar with it and i found it quite fascinating to see how it had been um moved on to adapt for primary care and, and that was that was how i changed things actually it was we got um approval from everybody to look at the green impact toolkit and we just started working our way through it so thank you robin are there any more questions in the chat yeah, so Jonathan's asked, how did you approach your town council for some funding? And, and I was kind of going to ask as well, like, how, how do you manage to find the pockets of funding that you've been able to apply for? I think we've just established a really strong relationship with our town council. So social prescribing was one of the factors that really helped us to get that relationship. So we'd built up lots of work with community groups. Um, our Froomtown, Froomtown Council were probably the first town council in the country to declare a climate emergency. So, you know, we're very lucky. We had a, a town council who were very aligned. So just lots of good conversations and saying, you know, how can we do things together and what can we do? Refill Froom was a good example of that. So our town council had a refill project. We had decided to join it. We just did all we could to align objectives, really. And there's lots of pots of funding around. and. We've just done it by, you know, talking to them. There's a, I think we got the um, period money through the mayor's fund that's um, available. So I would, I would just say go and talk to your town council and find, you know, mutual points of interest yep. and alignment. Brilliant. And Philippa asks uh, if you're in an area with good transport links that allows you to encourage greener travel. Yeah, it's a challenge um, being where we are because we're a very rural community. So um, I think that's why hybrid working has been quite important from a staff point of view is that, you know, we have a few staff that travel quite a long way in. So having to, being able to work a couple of days from home a week, that fitted with that strategy. Um, and we've just done lots with really encouraging electric cars. We've got charging points. Um, you know, we share things like bus routes and you know, encourage walking for the patients and things. So it's by no means perfect. There's still loads we can do, but it's um, we keep working with it. Brilliant. So, so if we're, we're sort of thinking now, Karen, we're going to go back into our staff rooms now and look at our tea bags and, and um, look at our recycling. Um, could you give us another, say one or two quick, again, a quick win, something that's quite easy that we can take back straight away from this meeting and start as we mean to go on. Okay, so if I was going for a really big impact, but simple, um, I, and and it's, I know it's challenging at the moment because of the climate, but for us, changing energy supplier was a really high impact action you can take that, you know, doesn't take an awful lot of um, effort when you, when you get to that point. Um, I would say, you know, just do things like go, go through your office supplies. You know, are you, are you buying sustainable paper? You know, are you buying locally? Are you supporting your local community? I think, you know, for me, that's, you know, we don't do our first thought is what can we buy locally? Because for me, particularly, you know, cost of living crisis, I'm really keen that as a practice, we do everything to support all our shops and our local community. And, you know, in that way as well. So maybe that's, yeah, maybe a bit more of a what can you do to support your local community? And I think that's a really good point. I mean, I'm, I'm also in a very rural location and and getting deliveries, um, you know, they, they are having to come some considerable distance. So 
we recently switched um, medical equipment suppliers to a, a local organisation who are not very far away. And aside of actually being really responsive and really pleased to get the business, um, you know, I, I, I can often get goods within 24 hours, which is which is pretty good. And they're, they're not a million miles away. So, again, I've built up a really good relationship with somebody very close. So that kind of echoes echoes with your conversations about about the um, speaking to the council um, and that there may even, I suppose, be you know, there's smaller villages, parish councils that might be keen to do something as well. So that's really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, well, we've done 45 minutes, so we've stuck <laughs> fantastically to time, which is brilliant. Thank you both ladies for giving up your time and energy today to present this webinar. Um, oh, sorry, um, Martin has his hand up. Martin. Hi, thank you, Nicola. Sorry. Um, I've, you've just said about how keeping to time, so I'll make it really quick. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask Karen, it was amazing because we spent a lot of time trying to get people to use the toolkit and to see, I think they're right at the top of the leaderboard and it was really easy to see why. Um, it was just about sometimes there are some quite specific ones where you have to make choices, even down to like um, providing only non-dairy milks and um, plant-based food. And sometimes you get into issues of, sort of making choices for people and you know individual choice so did they have any issues around that and how did they get kind of around them yeah i'd say the milk thing was um that was quite tricky so we did lots of introducing milks letting people try giving people the choice um we have a cafe so you can get milk if you want to as well so it doesn't mean that you can't get milk but we just do buy plant-based milk um yeah, I'd say it's tricky. I think for me, having the values right, I think one story that stuck out for me where I became very, very unpopular was we were trying to raise money for our local charity and everybody decided they were going to do some parachute jumps. And I said, well, I don't feel comfortable with this because it doesn't align with our values. So, you know, there was an awful lot of conversation around it, but because our values were strong, you know, it, actually in the end, everybody was okay with it. But it, you know, there was quite a lot of upset because, you know, I was saying, well, you can't do a parachute jump. And I was saying, you can, but you're not going to do it to raise money for our charity because of the values. So I think for me, it's having those things in place kind of help, but it, yeah, you, you're going to have to go through some discomfort. We're a small rural, you know, community, dairy farming's there. So if, if we do have milk in the practice, it's organic and we try and, you know, make sure that we make that adjustment, but um, yeah, it, comes back it, won't, always, it won't be always be easy. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, it's interesting you say that. And it's also about, you said about how it was all values across the team and even when you recruit and get people in. So it, it's all yeah. connected with that, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think it helps if you've got that. But it helps your position when you're, you know, you're making decisions that people might not always agree with, but actually you've all signed up to. So. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you, ladies, and thank you everybody for giving up your valuable time to to join us on the webinar. I hope you're finding these really useful and helpful. Um, it is being recorded, so we will post it um, very shortly. Um, so yeah, thank you so much and please keep your eyes out for the next webinar that will be coming in the next couple of months. Thank you again, everybody. Lovely to see you all. Just Thank to you. add as well to everyone that um, currently these webinars are free for anyone, whether you are a member or not, but soon they will be members only as we seek to continue to grow the IGPM as it is. So if you're not already a member, please do think about becoming one. The link is in the chat and you can go to our website for more information. But thanks for all coming today. I hope you managed to go get a nice, healthy, sustainable lunch and a decent break as well. Thank you, Robin. That's great. Take care.